What was the inspiration for the book and what kind of research went into it? The book was inspired by uh, an art forgery scandal that erupted in, in uh, emerged in France a, a few years ago. And what set this one apart from some of the previous big forgery scandals that we've had in the art world is the nature of the paintings involved. Uh, most art forgers uh, forge 20th century works uh, for the very simple reason that they're much easier to forge. This forgery scandal involved old master paintings and the forgery was so skilled and such a gifted artist that he could paint uh, like a German and Dutch and Italian old master painters and fool the very, very best eyes in the business. And I just had been dying to write about um, about this uh, this case in, 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 in a fictionalized way. Um, so my character retired from Israeli intelligence, and, and then he is drafted uh, by the French and the Italian police uh, to track down this this forger. And in order to find the greatest art forger who have ever lived, the twist of the story is that Gabriel Lahn must become the greatest art forger who ever lived. Uh, he is a very talented art restorer, and 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 art restorers. Um, can be very good forgers if they set their mind to it. But this is a bit of a series reset in a way. Um, this is a, um, a sort of a restored, um, retouched Gabriel Lahn that we see in this novel. Um, you know, this is not a an espionage thriller. This is um, an art heist, art caper um, uh, th thriller. It, it is a um, I don't want to spoil it for you, no, no. but there are some whopper uh, twists in this novel. Uh, and it was just a joy to write. I loved writing every single page of this book. You ever been out to a store and you come across a famous painting, or at least something that you think might be made by a famous artist? But you're not sure, I mean, due to the price, and you would like to know, is it like a forgery? You know what? There's a process behind that, and it involves some really crazy science. You gotta check this out. Follow me. We usually begin with just a close visual examination of the artwork. So just to describe what we're looking at, again, this is a medieval painting or supposedly a medieval painting. We would expect that the paint is going to be egg tempera from this time period, so it's pigment mixed into egg yolk. Um, it's on a wooden panel, so this is a panel painting. It's a relatively large wooden panel. You can see the thickness. Yeah, it's really thick. So we're looking at relatively low magnification. And so what you see here is the ground layer, that white material, yeah. would have been the original layer that's placed onto the wooden panel. The red layer that you see in there is a material called bowl. It's kind of the glue that will cause the gold to stick. And then as it is aged or artificially aged, all of these layers begin to break apart and the cracks form. So you can see several of them here in this detail image. And then inside of those cracks, you'll notice they're quite dark. Yeah, really dark. And so that is, under a natural condition, just an accumulation of dirt and grime and old varnish. Uh, a forger might want to enhance these cracks to make them really pop by pushing something into those uh, crevices, uh, perhaps a pigment or a dark resin material. So what you're looking at here is just a diffuse reflection image using visible light, what you saw when we were looking at it on the table. But then if you move that light source to the far extreme, it will begin to cast shadows and it gives you an idea of all the surface deformations that exist in this painting. You had mentioned earlier that it's a highly textured piece. Yeah. And so you really begin to pick out some of that texture, examples of the cracks that are running through the surface, uh, the crack lure that is in the paint. Now what you're looking at is a fluorescence image. So we've shined a black light onto the surface and that ultraviolet radiation is gonna be absorbed by the varnish and the paint materials and then it's going to be re-emitted in the visible. And that's what we're looking at here. And it really helps us to pick out some things about the condition of the piece. For instance, you can note certain areas that show up different where under visible light they look the same. 
This tells us this is a modern intervention where someone has done some retouching, perhaps of a damaged area in that gilding. Now what you're looking at is an x-ray of the painting. So this is an x-ray just like you would have in the doctor's office to look at a broken arm, but instead of looking at bones and flesh, we're looking at the distribution of the heavy metal pigments in the artist's paints, as well as the density differences in the wood. And you can see examples of metal that have been driven into the wooden panel. Here, for instance, is a modern looking nail that's going right up through the bottom of the panel. Uh, other nails here are being used to attach this uh, component of the frame around the top. And then you can see those two wooden dowels that were protruding in the raking light oh. image. You can actually see that they've been filled in or they have a different density from the surrounding wood. An interesting thing that we noted here is the little tail end of a screw uh, buried in the back of the panel, we assume. Uh, the head has been broken off or is missing, but yeah. you can see the threads of the screw, which of course would be a modern intervention. So this XRF spectrometer has an X-ray tube that's going to irradiate a small area of the sample, about the width of your hair, uh, with X-rays. The instrument takes about 15 seconds, blowing some helium across the surface to get rid of all the room air, which would otherwise absorb our characteristic X-rays. We can identify lead, small amount of calcium, a big signal from barium. There's some zinc present. Looks like a little bit of chromium, and it looks like that pretty much accounts for it. Thinking this is a green earth, we would expect to see a certain suite of elements that show up in that mineral. So that's green earth. Oh wow, okay. Sort of an olive drab color, a yellowy brownish green. But curiously, in this area, we're seeing the element chromium. And chromium is not a component of green earth. In fact, chromium might appear in a more oh, wow. modern pigment a chrome oxide or viridian green. And you can also tell the color is slightly different oh, yeah. and the sort of aqua teal of the viridian green more closely matches what we're seeing, especially when we looked at that under the microscope downstairs. So this continues to raise our suspicion that this may not be an ancient material, but might in fact be a material that was only available after the 1800s. And that little layer of paint, what we like to collect and call a cross section, and then we'll pluck that little layered cake sample out. We mount it in an epoxy block, cut and polish it so that we can see the full history of the artwork from the conception to the finished product at the surface. We're looking at some images of that tiny flake of paint that Glennis took from the surface of the artwork. So if you imagine that the painting is sort of like a cake or the Earth's crust, then what we're seeing here is the top layer, like the frosting, and then that red glaze layer. And then we have this pink layer, and then below it, this sort of translucent um, area is the gesso, so that would have been the ground layer. And then this is a really interesting cross-section because when I take my hand away, what we're seeing here is one of those deep cracks that we saw under right, the optical right, the microscope. Right, right, dark area. Yeah, and so you can see that there's two kind of um, colors that are present, a dark, dark, brown, black, and then a lighter brown. This is so hard for me to get, I mean, just, it looks huge, because I'm looking, like, it looks down, but like you said, this thing is just... Yeah, so, so this scale bar is 20 microns, and that's about a fifth of the width of a human hair. Now, you remember that the blue pigment in the false color infrared was suggestive of ultramarine. Yeah. So for ultramarine, from a 1300s painting, we would expect the source to be lapis lazuli. We're essentially gonna bounce a laser beam off of the surface of the pigment particles and measure its scattering. And that's gonna become a molecular fingerprint for a particular compound, uh, or in this case, a pigment. And then after doing a library match, we see that we have an amazingly good match with the, um, the reference spectrum here in pink, and that's for ultramarine. It really is a very clear... Oh, like exact match yes. almost. And so our spectrum is coming from a synthetic version of just the blue. Gotcha. But we can tell that it's synthetic, and that's interesting because it wasn't synthesized until 1826. Oh, wow. So. Okay. That's like a <laughs> huge red flag. 
we've provided some pretty clear evidence, physical evidence, that this cannot be a 1300s panel painting. There's the use of modern pigments throughout the full extent of the artwork, uh, and they were just not available to uh, an artist back in the 1300s. I think we're pretty much convinced that this is not right. what it purports to be. Where do you work? I, I work in longhand, in pencil, um, and I prefer to write on the floor. I prefer to write lying on my stomach on the floor. Um, odd, you say? Perhaps. Um, it, it, for, the, um, for those of you keeping score at home, you can Google Muriel Spark, the author of uh, Miss Jean Brody. Um, you'll see it. The first photograph that'll come up, I think, is is this great photograph of young Muriel Spark lying on the floor with her notebooks. One of my favorite pictures of her as, as um, one of my favorite writers. I also get fiddle. I also get fiddle itis. I mean, what is fiddle itis? I need to sit there at the computer and go click, click, click. It's very easy to make revisions. You know, go back and tick, 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 and and um, there's just something about slowing the pace down in longhand that I, I find that I can write um, better, more polished, complete um, copy. Uh, and it's amazing when, you know, when I, I finish, I'll get like a you know, stack like this and oh, I can really go back through it and find page after page after page of copy that just ends up in the book without a single revision to it. Well, I work seven days a week, um, always. I write every day always, um, uh, except when I'm here, obviously. Um, I try to not overdo it early. Um, I, 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 if, a, if, a, if a book is like this, you know, I have a, maybe about that much that I can see. Um, I, get to, I get to work as quickly as possible. I cannot bring it to life on notepads or, or you know, note cards. I can't outline it. Um, I, I, I get, Sometimes I just really don't have a clear idea of where I'm going with the story. But I, as soon as I feel comfortable, I start writing and bring it to life. Um, I try not to overdo it in September and October. By November 1st, I'm starting to get a little jokey feel. <laughs> little, 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 and then December 1st, is, uh, January 1st is utter deadline panic. Um, and so I will start working, you know, 10 hours a day sitting there. Um, 12 hours a day, let you know, in, in February. Um, I, I'm not a big sleeper. I've never been a big sleeper. When I'm working on a book, you know, three hours a night is, you know, maybe uh, four hours on a good night. That's, that's what, what I sleep. Um, all time favorite movie? Uh, Casablanca. Casablanca. All time favorite book. Or if you have to pick three, you can pick three. I mean, um, come on, we're running. 1984. Out of time. 1984. 1984. Uh, underrated as a thriller, and any anyone who has read any of my books knows that I'm uh, adore Fitzgerald, and there are clear, clear, clear allusions to Fitzgerald in this book. Um, uh, and one of the interesting things about this novel is that a, a, a great deal of it takes place in New York. Gabriel makes two trips to, to New York, three trips to, to the tri-state area in the course of this novel and spends some time um, out on Long Island. If you could have a dinner party and invite anyone you wanted to invite, who would you have at the dinner party? Oh boy, well, I, would, I would love them. Um, George Orwell to be there. Um, poor George. I really want to write a book so, or do a movie about about the writing of 1984. He's dying of tuberculosis. He's holed up in a cottage in Scotland. It'd just be a great story. Uh, so I'd like to have poor George or Eric Blair uh, there. Um, two writers that I just love and I love this, the legendary stories about them. I would love to have Gore Vidal and Norman Mailer at, at dinner. That would be great. Um, for, uh, the, the two of them had a, a great literary feud. Uh, it included one night at a New York cock, cocktail party. They got into an argument and, and Norman Mailer decked um, Gorby Dahl. And Gorby Dahl's laying on, the, laying, on the, laying on the floor with his lip bleeding and, and said famously, once again, Mr. Mailer, 
words fail you. I'd, I'd, I'd love to, um, to have them <laughs> dinner. Did you have the ending in mind when you started writing? This one, um, definitely. Because this is, I guess this novel falls into the category of the sort of the caper heist story. And caper heist stories, of course, always have to have, to have a killer twist at the end. Um, without giving too much away, obviously the twist in this one involves the, the real identity of this forger who is um, um, uh, putting these unbelievable, these, these masterpieces out on the marketplace. And so um, that the identity is held to the very last chapter of the novel, almost the darn last page. Um, so I knew how, how it was going to end. I wasn't quite sure how it was going to get there, um, but I did know how this one's going to end. 